Hello and welcome to part 2. In part 1 I showed you method 1, how to make short motion blur transitions. Here's the transition I made in part 1, with different music. In this tutorial, part 2, I'll show you another method, which produces a wider camera panning movement. This method uses Shotcut, and also GIMP, which is a free graphics editor. Don't worry if you are not familiar with GIMP, I'll explain everything in easy stages. It's probably a good idea for you to watch part 1 first, although it's not essential. So here we go then. To begin, I've opened Shotcut, and I've put my original two clips on the timeline, like I had at the beginning of method 1. Now I'm using version 20.07.11, which was released in July 2020. Please note that Shotcut is updated regularly, and new features are added or may be changed on every update, so some features may be different if you're using a later version than this. Now before we start, it's important to know your video mode. Now go to settings, then video mode, and you can see I'm working at 1080p at 25 frames per second. Now a final setting is to make sure that both preview scaling is set to none, and in the proxy menu, uncheck the Use Proxy feature. Now we don't want to use either preview scaling or proxy editing, this is because I'm going to export two frames of the video, and if either of these features were on, the export would come out blurred. Now I need to export the last frame of clip 1, and the first frame of clip 2. Now I navigate to the last frame of clip 1 by using the keyboard shortcut ALT right arrow, and then I press the left arrow once, and I go to file, then export frame. Now think of this as taking a snapshot of the preview screen, which you then save as a PNG file. Then I advanced one more frame using the right arrow, and I export the first frame of clip 2. Again I give it an appropriate file name. Then I close or minimise Shotcut, and open GIMP. I'm using version 2.8. Here's GIMP's main screen. I'm using a dark theme. You can find out how to apply a dark theme on the internet, but of course you can use the default light theme if you wish. To continue, I select Open as Layers. Then I select the two PNG files I just exported from Shotcut. Now you will only see image number 1, that's because image number 2 is hidden underneath image number 1. Next I go to Image, then Canvas Size. In the dialog box I need to type in 3840 pixels for the canvas width. Let me explain why, I need to make an image of twice the width of my exported frame. Now my exported frame has a width of 1920 pixels, and my calculator tells me that 1920 times 2 equals 3840. So I type in 3840 and I keep the height as 1080 pixels. I click resize, then resize again, and the background extends to twice the width of the image with my image on the left. In the top left panel, I select the Move tool. Then I move the two images around so that they appear next to each other. Use the Snap to Canvas Edges feature, which you select by going to the View menu and scrolling down. This makes it easy for you to align the two images. When it's done, I have two images side by side. Then I export this double image as a JPG file. Again, I give it a unique file name. I close GIMP, then open it again. Then I reopen my newly exported wide image. I then need to make this image really super wide, in fact 10,000 pixels wide. Now to do this, I go to Image, then Canvas Size again, and type in a width value of 10,000. Zoom out, oops, not enough. There we are, I can see the entire image. Now I need to select the Scale tool, and stretch out the image to fill the canvas. Keep the height at 1080 pixels. GIMP takes a little while to process this.
OK, I'm now done in GIMP. So I now open Shutcut again. As you can see, I've got three video tracks with the same two clips as I used in part one on track V1. No filters are applied to these tracks. Now here's a reminder of the transition again. My first job is to reactivate both proxy editing and preview scaling. This is an optional step, but I prefer to do this since it speeds up editing on the timeline and it reduces lag. A dialog appears saying I have to close and open shortcut to apply these changes. Now once this is done, editing on the timeline is very smooth both forwards and reverse. I go to open file and import the 10,000 pixel wide image I just created in GIMP. It appears in the preview screen. I drag it to the timeline and place it on a higher track. Then I need to apply a blur box filter to this clip. Now, because the image was stretched in GIMP, I won't need to apply a full 99 pixel blur to this clip. By trial and error, I find that a value of around 20 to 25 pixels for the width looks OK. I make the height 0 pixels since I want a totally horizontal blur. Then I apply a size and position filter to this clip. Now before I continue, I'll just remind you that since I'm using version 20.07, my size and position filter looks like the image on the left here. However, if you're using version 20.09 or later, in other words, after September 2020, the filter will be called the size, position and rotate filter and will look like the image on the right. It's no problem though, because the four important value fields are identical in both versions. Now, down on the keyframes panel, I make sure I'm at the beginning of the clip and I drag out a 14 frame transition. I'll just zoom out the keyframes timeline and drag the black circle. Now I go to the size and position filter panel and type in a value of 10,000 here. This of course is the width of my super wide image. It's important for me to select distort. The image aligns to the left hand edge of the preview screen. However, I notice a weird dark edge on the left hand edge of the image. So I put a value of minus 100 into the position field. This moves the image along to the left by 100 pixels and hides the unwanted left hand edge of the image. I advance to the end of the keyframe by pressing the seek next icon and again type 10,000 into the width field. Next, I'm going to type minus 8000 into the top value field. If you are not sure why I type this value, I'll explain in a short while, but for now I'll continue. On the timeline, I press play to preview the transition, and you can see what happens. The white image whizzes quickly from right to left, creating my blurred pan effect. I then go a frame at a time and locate the end of the 14 frame transition and press O for out on the clip. And finally, I slide clip 2 to the right to snap to the end of the transition clip. And I'm now ready to preview the transition. Hmm, it looks OK, but I'd like to see it after export, so I'll just trim the beginning of clip 1 and the end of clip 2, move the whole timeline to the start, and then I'll export it as an MP4 video. Now, I'm aware that you may not have understood why I put the values I did into the size and position fields. So in case you didn't, I'm going to explain exactly how this filter operates and what the values in the filter panel mean. Now take a look at the size and position filter in detail. I'm actually using version 20.07, so the filter panel looks like this. Let me explain what these four values mean. For clarity, I've named these four values A, B, C and D. The first position value, value A, means pixels from the left. The second position value, value B, means pixels from the top. The first size value, value C, means image width in pixels. And the second size value, value D, means image height in pixels. Now the first two position values, A and B, actually refer to the position relative to the preview screen in Shotgun. To make this clear, I'm highlighting the preview screen in yellow. There it is. Now before we go any further, you'll need to know that a video screen in video mode 1080p, or HD, which is high definition, has a height of 1080 pixels and a width of 1920 pixels. 
it's very handy to remember those two values. To understand it further, I've added a pixels ruler to the top of the preview screen. You can see from that that the left hand edge of the screen is represented by the value zero. Now a crucial thing to understand is that the pixels ruler doesn't stop at the right hand edge of the preview screen. It continues to the right using positive numbers and to the left using negative numbers. Now it's important in creating this whip pan transition that you know how to position an image just by using the four values in the size and position filter only. This diagram will help to explain it further. It shows a highly zoomed out image of the shotcut screen. The pixels ruler this time goes from minus 8000 pixels to plus 8000 pixels. It's positioned so that the left hand edge of the yellow preview screen is aligned with position zero. Now here is the 10,000 pixel wide image. The size and position filter is set at left equals naught, so the image is also left aligned. If I make the first position value minus 100, it moves the wide image slightly to the left to hide the small dark area of the image. Then if I keyframe its position to minus 8000, the wide image shoots across to the left. Notice there is a slight margin of 80 pixels on the right of the image which hides the dark area on the right hand side. There's one more thing to know. Although the image moves across the screen from right to left, it's actually a left to right transition because if you look carefully in the previous screen, the effect is as if the camera is panning from left to right. So there we have our magic numbers for the keyframing. Just start at minus 100 and end at minus 8000. Easy to remember. In fact, this next diagram makes it even clearer. Notice that the three flashing yellow numbers here are the same for both the start and the end keyframes. It's only the two white values that you will need to change to give the horizontal movement of the image. So that's how to create the left to right whip pan transition. But how do you create a right to left transition? Well, I have some good news. Take a look at this animation. I'll keep playing the animation over and over. This is similar to the animation I showed you a few minutes ago, but with two very important differences. Well, difference one is that the wide image this time starts at minus 8080 pixels and ends at minus 100. That's the other way round to earlier. Difference two is that the double image has had the two frames A and B reversed, with frame A on the right and frame B on the left. This final diagram shows a direct comparison of the two procedures. It shows clearly that to make a right to left transition, you just reverse the order of the position values and also change the double frame image so that image A is on the right and image B is on the left. Can you go wider than 10,000 pixels? Well, the answer is yes, and it's quite easy to do. So I'm going back to my original Venice project and I'm going to import my 10,000 pixel wide double image. Now the first thing I do is to add a blur box filter. There we are. And also a size and position filter like I did earlier. Now before I dragged out a 14 frame transition in the keyframes panel. This time I'm going to make it a little longer let's say 20 pixels. Then I go to the size and position filter, click distort, and I type in 30,000 here, not 10,000. And as you can see, Shotcut has stretched the image immediately. However, I still have a weird effect on the left-hand side of the image. To get rid of this, I'm going to try minus 200 pixels this time. Ah, it doesn't quite get rid of the unwanted edge, so I'll try minus 300. Ah, still not right, so I think I'll try actually minus 500 here. Ah, that's better. Now I go to the end keyframe, and again type in 30,000. Now I need to keyframe it so that the image shoots across to the left. But what I'm going to do is to take 2,000 off the 30,000 width, because the preview screen is 1,920 pixels. 
So if I put minus 28,000 pixels here, it should get rid of the right hand edge. Hmm, nearly. However, I think I'll put in minus 27,500 instead. There we are, it disappears. I just have to trim this clip to 20 frames long, not 14 as earlier, and then move clip two along to the right. And here's the result, a 30,000 pixel wide whip pan transition. Now watching that nearly sent me dizzy. But why stop at 30,000? Here's how to do a 50,000 wide transition. So I drag my 10,000 pixel wide image, apply a blur box filter, then a size and position filter, and drag out this time slightly more, let's say 24 frames. Then I click distort and type in 50,000 here. And to get rid of the edge, I'm going to try minus a thousand pixels. Ah, that works great. So I move to the end keyframe and I'm going to try minus 47,000 pixels here. Great, that works too. I'll just trim this clip to 24 frames and move clip two along. And here's the result, a 50,000 pixel wide whip pan transition. And don't forget, for a right to left transition, just reverse the two position values. Right, I've nearly finished. Now, just before I go, though, I'd like to run through a short project from start to finish to remind you of how to create these whip pan transitions. I'll try to go quite quickly, and I hope I'll also show you a few tips and tricks along the way. So here we go. I open Shotcut, and as you can see, I have five short video clips on track V1. My brief is to create whip pan transitions in between each clip. That means I will have four of these transitions. I'm going to make my transitions run in alternate directions. So transition one will be left to right. Transition two will be right to left. Transition three will be left to right. And for transition four, it will be right to left again. Right, I'll add a couple more video tracks and zoom in the timeline. There we go. I'm going to navigate to the last frame of clip 1, go to export as a frame, and name this file simply 1. Then I advance one frame, go to export as a frame again, and simply name this one 2. Then I continue in the same way with all the other clips, and I end up with a folder of PNG files named 1, 2, 3, and so on, up to 8. There they are. Now I'm going to use the Windows feature of renaming these files. So I select them all and then point to the first one, then right click and from the menu select rename. I then type in Paris frame open bracket one close bracket. Then when I press return, all the files will be renamed with an incremental number. Then I open GIMP. Now before I start to make my double width images, I'm going to open Notepad and type in the following. On line 1, 1, 2. Next line, 4, 3. Next line, 5, 6. And the next line, 8, 7. Can you see why I'm doing this? This reminds me that for transitions 2 and 4, which are right to left transitions, the images have to be reversed. So for example, for transition 2, I have to put image 3 on the right and image 4 on the left. And for transition 4, I should also have to put image 7 on the right and image 8 on the left. So in GIMP, I select Open as Layers and then Import Images 1 and 2. Then I make them into a double image, 3840 pixels wide. I go to image, then canvas size, then type in 3840, resize, resize, and then zoom out. I then select snap to canvas edges and position image 2 so it's to the right of image 1. I export this image as a JPEG file. Once again, I just simply call it 1 and I'll rename it later. I remove these two layers by clicking this bin icon. I then do the same for images 3 and 4, but as I just explained, I need to put image 4 on the left and image 3 on the right. My notepad jotting helps me to keep track of this. 
So I continue in the same way and soon I have four double JPEG images. I'll just speed up the action here. Right, as I did before, I select the four images, point to the first one, right click and in the menu select Rename. Then I type Paris Whip Pan Double, open bracket, one, close bracket. Then when I hit return, the four files will be renamed incrementally. I then close and reopen GIMP and this time I import my double image one by selecting open as layers. Then I make the canvas size 10,000 pixels width and using the scale tool, I stretch the image and export it as another JPG. And of course I repeat this process with my other three double images. I then rename the files again. Then I close GIMP and open Shutcut. So I go to Open File and select my first super wide image. I then apply a blur box filter and set the width to about 25 pixels. Well, 23 pixels looks okay here and the height to zero pixels. I then apply a size and position filter and in the keyframes panel on the left, I stretch out a 14 frame keyframe. I select the start keyframe and in the size and position filter, I select distort, then type in the values 10,000 for the image width and minus 100 for the position. Then I go to the end keyframe and type in the values 10,000 again and this time minus 8,000 for the position. I then need to make my transition clip just 14 frames long and then I select ripple track and move my clips along. Then I repeat the process twice more with my other two clips. A useful tip is to copy and paste the filters to the transition clips instead of having to set the filters from scratch. Now there's the copy filters icon. So I click it to copy all filters applied to this clip. Then I select this clip and click Paste Filters. Then since the second transition is a right to left transition, I just reverse the values in the size and position filter. Then I trim the clip and carry on repeating the process for the other two transitions. I'll speed up the action here to save time. For transition 3, I simply copy and paste the filters directly from transition 1 because they are both left to right transitions. And for transition 4, I copy the filters from transition clip 2. And I'm nearly finished. All I need to do to finish is to add some background music and also the important whoosh sound effects. Now I described how to do these in part 1, so it's worth taking a look. And here's the final video with music and whoosh sound effects added. That's it. Thanks for watching.